talk about the future of content. My name is Todd. Uh, I'm from Austin, Texas, and I run a small digital agency called Four Kitchens. Uh, we build things. Uh, we build digital experience platforms that scale, delight, and deliver measurable results. We do a lot of work with Decoupled, and while we've specialized in Drupal for more than 13 years, we work with a wide range of content management systems, architectures, and devices. So, to put it simply, we make big websites. Once upon a time, there was a fridge. It had one job to keep things cold. Somebody's madly trying to get in the back there. <laughs> We'll, we'll let him in, and then we'll get started. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Come on in. All right. So, once upon a time, there was a fridge. It had one job to keep things cold, and it did its job well. Fridgeco, the company that built that fridge, was doing fine, too, but they thought they could do better. So one day, as they so often did, the Fridgeco product team gathered to brainstorm. How could they differentiate themselves from the competition? The product manager was tired of hearing the same old ideas. Bigger <coughs> capacity, more energy efficiency, more shelving. It was nothing new, nothing exciting. It seemed like they'd had this meeting a hundred times before, and they had. Someone across the table was looking at his phone, bored, and watching him rudely tap at the screen, she was suddenly struck with a totally new concept. Let's connect it to the internet, she said. Silence. A fridge connected to the internet? Asked the guy with the phone, incredulously. Mm -hmm. Yes. That sounds ridiculous, he said. No, she said. It's the future. It will have a bright color screen. It will support apps, just like your phone, we can partner with recipe websites and integrate with Google Calendar. And Twitter's big, right? Let's put Twitter on the fridge. And so it was that Fridge Co. ushered the humble fridge into the information age. Now, I have no idea if this is how it happened. Fridge Co. is a fictional company. But of course, this seems plausible. And we do have the internet on fridges now, right? Imagine that it's 10 years ago. It's 2009. The iPhone had just been released. It's about a year into its release cycle. You're a software developer, as you probably are, and you get a call from Fridgeco asking you to make their vision a reality. How would you go about implementing something like that? You'd have to build a software development kit, an SDK, and make a set of standards for building apps for your fridge. Competitors would follow suit, so Fridgeco, of course, wouldn't want to create an open standard to give them a, a, a leg up. Uh, so you wind up creating this proprietary platform for fridge development, all on your own. And then so does everybody else. Fridge Corp, Amalgamated Refrigeration Incorporated, everybody builds their own software development kit for internet-enabled fridges. Now let's think about this from an even more complicated angle. Let's say you're a grocery delivery service. You're a startup. Your job is to deliver groceries. Clearly, you want to be on this thing, right? What better way to get people to use your service than to have an app on a fridge that the moment you realize you're out of eggs or milk or whatever, you can tap a couple of buttons and you get it delivered to your house. So you want to plaster your app across all fridge brands because there's a dozen of them. Now you have to build an app from scratch for every single software development kit, every single platform, every single brand of fridge. And you're having a hard enough time just getting your regular old iPhone app out the door. However, this isn't the case if you have the right technologies and workflows in place. If you've centralized all of your products, your content, eggs, SKUs, milk, services, into a single consistent data model, and you have made that information available using a robust API, you can rapidly develop apps for all kinds of devices. So you can do this quickly for all of these different fridge brands. So it seemed like a crazy idea 10 years ago, putting the internet on the fridge, is almost trivially easy today. And it's not because we got really good at making fridges. It's because we've created all of the underlying infrastructure needed to rapidly adopt new technologies, whether they're fridges, streaming devices, home assistants, whatever. Today, right now, today, we expect our digital interactions to span a variety of experiences, 
and contexts. We are reading, watching, and listening to content. We're doing this on different devices, in different situations, and with different needs, <coughs> like looking up recipes on a fridge. So first, let's define a couple of concepts. One is experience. Experience, when I talk about experience in, in this talk, I'm talking about what's inside the content. It's the medium of the content itself, text, video, sound, and the message it delivers, it's content. So the, the emotion, the information, what you're trying to convey, that's the experience. Context is everything outside of that experience. It wraps the, con the experience. Context is about the device you're using, the operating system that it runs, the web browser you've chosen, the physical environment you're in, your history with that brand, the needs you're trying to meet, and the mental model you're using to compare this content to other content that you've experienced. So context is everything around the actual content itself. So for example, watching a movie is an experience. The story told in the movie is an experience. That it is visual, that it has an audio component, that it is emotional, that is the experience. But watching it in a theater with your kids, or on your phone while flying to a conference, or while uh, curled up with your dog on the sofa, these are the contexts in which you experience that content. So today I'm not actually gonna talk a lot about experience. I'm not gonna talk a lot about the medium or the, the content itself. I'm gonna be talking about context, everything around it. And today I'm going to make eight predictions. So with this in mind, eight predictions about the future of content. It's not an exhaustive list, it's just eight things that I think are really interesting and likely to come true, where we're headed next. Seeing as how this is a decoupled conference, the first few of these are specifically about decoupling, so they're not gonna be a surprise to you. This is a different, more informed, more specific audience. But stick in there, I promise that we are going to make some uh, interesting turns really soon. So, prediction number one, CMSs will be content repositories, not website managers. Back in the 1990s, content was tied to presentation. It was like a book, it was like a brochure. The content that you were trying to convey was tied to and fully encapsulated within the thing that you were delivering. So the, the information in a brochure was the brochure itself. Very similarly with flat files. So we would create HTML files, it had everything you needed, the content, the presentation layer, you'd upload it to a web server, give somebody the URL, you're done. That became a little cumbersome over time, so we developed desktop publishing systems that allowed you to better manage those flat files, things like front page. Uh, and then ultimately we started seeing more web-based tools like GeoCities, but they were still dealing with flat files. In the 2000s, web-based CMSs uh, started to get released, Drupal in 2000, WordPress in 2003, .NET Nuke in 2003, and Joomla in 2005. Those are some of the uh, more open source varieties. And these web-based CMSs were a single piece of software divided between the front end, the display of content, and the back end, the management of the content. So first, we could display this content in a web browser. So you could uh, open up a browser on your desktop or laptop or whatever, and the CMS would deliver the content in the presentation layer to you. And then came RSS and Atom feeds, which allowed people to syndicate content to other sites and absorb content in their own. Then, 2008 or so, smartphones and tablets, which ushered, ushered in this mobile revolution and totally altered our approach to front-end design, but it didn't fundamentally change our approach to content management. Meanwhile, on the back end, CMSs are storing text, media, and user-generated content. And as these became more popular, web administrators started demanding more back-end tools to manage their sites. So with people uh, submitting comments and blog posts and, and creating profiles, well, now you need to have user profiles and, and security and access controls and permissions. Ultimately, two people wanted layout tools. So they didn't just want a, a single stream of a, of a blog post with a fixed right rail that they couldn't do anything, anything interesting with. They wanted tools that allowed them to click and drag and, and move bits of content around the page. Uh, and of course, integrations with other systems, with CRMs and e-commerce tools and all kinds of stuff. And ultimately, this made our CMS really heavy and complicated because it's doing all of this stuff all at once. And CMSs fundamentally were no longer about content management. They were about website management because it's doing all of this stuff. So who here remembers, uh, 
who here is familiar with Drupal? Probably everybody, right? Do you remember back in the day when Drupal called itself community plumbing? It didn't call itself a content management system. It was a community plumbing tool, meaning it's about building communities. This was in this era of the, the identity crisis of the content management system. It's not about content, it's about managing an entire web presence or web system. So the 2010s came along. And more recently, we've seen this incredible proliferation of devices, apps, and channels. Set-top boxes and voice-integrated uh, assisted devices and all kinds of things. So these new technologies allowed us to do new things and had new data to share with these sites. Location awareness. Uh, new interaction patterns like gestures and touch, voice commands. These apps uh, that, that were custom built for these devices demanded new expectations of user friendliness. So we created this mindset in the past eight, nine years in which everything is an app or has app-like capabilities. How many people here have said like, I want my website to be like an app or to, to feel like an app, right? That's the new standard for user friendliness. Meanwhile, we've also seen some new channels for publishing content and engaging users. So media companies, for example, now have to contend with Facebook instant articles, Apple News, and all kinds of other off-site distribution channels of their content. In our scramble to keep up, we spin up new websites, new apps, and new tools to satisfy our short-term, timely business needs. And these endpoints often duplicate content, code, and effort. Not only does this drastically increase the effort and cost of maintaining our digital presence, but it's led to inconsistent, bare bones, and just plain bad experiences for our audiences. So how many of you find yourselves in this position now? It's a nightmare, right? In the future, surprise, here we are, decoupled days. The future is decoupled architecture and centralized content, and we're already beginning to see the shift uh, to a more agile approach to architecture. So, for those of you who aren't 100% in the know about what decoupled means, it means this. Here we have a traditional CMS. So, we have both the front end and the back end powered by a single piece of software. Imagine that we separate the two, and each piece is a separate piece of software that is focused on a specific task to display or to manage the content. And this resulting architecture is called decoupled. Some people refer to it as headless. Some people draw a distinction between the two. It's all kind of the same thing. So when we talk about the front end, we most commonly mean your website, and when we talk about the back end, we most commonly mean your content, where all of your content and data are stored. And these two are connected by an API that pulls content from the database and turns it into markup. That's decoupled in a nutshell. A lot of people think that in order to decouple their CMS, you have to rebuild everything from scratch, and that's not true. So here's an example of uh, some work that we did with PRI, Public Radio International, not too long ago. Uh, we decoupled their homepage by keeping their underlying site on Drupal 7 and decoupling the front end. Interesting side benefit of this, uh, the team, uh, your team perhaps, gets to work with more widely understood code and design patterns. So rather than having to learn Drupal 7's PHP template theming layer, uh, they can just pick up standard out of the box HTML, CSS, JavaScript. So one of the project leads for the PRI decoupling project said that it was the first time in years that their team enjoyed working on the code base. It was actually fun. So when your site is decoupled, you can centralize your content, meaning you can store all of it in a single place, regardless of how many websites it may appear in. You can then attach different sites to this content repository. Perhaps you need a microsite for a specific topic or a blog for a featured author. And then the same API that you use to decouple the two can be used to connect those other endpoints, those other sites, services. This is content centralization. Second prediction, content will be extensible and modular. A modern CMS does not treat the website as the primary experience. A modern CMS is multi-device, but it's not designed for specific devices. This means you have to think about content first. Not websites, not devices. You should let your CMS deliver structured content and let the device's software or the app handle the rest of the work. Send the content to the device and let that device figure out what to do with it rather than your content management system. If your content is properly modeled, if you have reusable fields and robust content types, 
you can very quickly support new devices and experiences. And one of the things that makes open source CMSs like Drupal, WordPress, but in particular Drupal great, is the ability to quickly add new fields, content types, modify those. So here we have the centralized content model. If you want to add support for an iPhone app, chances are you're going to add some location awareness. So now you have location awareness capability, which means you can now more easily support all other location aware devices like Android or other uh, mobile devices. Let's say you want to create a Roku app. In doing so, you're adding a lot of metadata fields to video assets. But those same fields can be reused by sites like YouTube and Vimeo, and they can also be reused by uh, uh, other streaming devices like Apple TV, Samsung Smart TV. So by adding just a handful of fields, you've now expanded your capabilities and the, um, your ability to, to adopt new apps. Alexa, if you add read aloud or conversational fields, you now have the ability for, uh, you, ha you have the ability to support all kinds of devices and apps that convert text to speech and the other way around. And then adding feeds and things like um, accelerated mobile pages. These are very, very, very similar to Facebook instant articles and Apple News. So if you just add a well-structured feed, you're essentially getting all this other stuff for free. That's the point of this reusable modular content model. You add one piece of information or one capability that now expands your ability to reach multiple devices in that same family. And in the future, now, all of these front ends are first class citizens. There isn't a world in which, well, the website is really the thing that we lean into and that's the most important thing. That's the first class citizen in our digital strategy and everything else is secondary. That's not really the case. Everything is a first class citizen. But the content has to be modular so it can be assembled and delivered to somebody based on their context. The device they're using, their mindset, where they're at, what their need is. The content, the experience remains the same but the context is different. So for example, perhaps you want shorter titles for social posts to reach a certain character limit or for uh, uh, less um, uh, uh, attention um, motivated uh, audiences. But with this centralized content model, you can add these additional fields and content types rather than building a separate system for every channel that you want to reach. An example of this is some of the work that um, we've done with NBC. NBC has a ton of content. And this content has to be delivered to many, many platforms, different websites, microsites, set-top devices, all kinds of stuff. So rather than building multiple solutions for multiple devices, NBC has combined this into a single content solution. So the same infrastructure and content that powers a Saturday Night Live website also powers the Saturday Night Live apps for iPhone and Android, for example. And here's a really interesting use case that, that we came across with Alexa. Uh, NBC wanted to create an Alexa skill that would respond to questions like, hey Alexa, when is AP Bio on? Or when is SNL on? So we already have a showtime field in the content model, right? We have a show content type, we have a showtime content field, and it looks like this. This is the data that's put in there. So for those of you who watch TV and maybe read, remember the days of TV Guide, 9 slash 8 C means 9 8 central. That little lowercase c means central time zone. So you know it's 9 Eastern, 8 Central. However, if Alexa were to read this aloud, Alexa would say 9, 8, C. <laughs> so that doesn't really make sense. We need to modify this for this uh, device. So here's what we did. We created a new field and we called it Showtime Spoken. And we actually spelled out the word central. So now Alexa says 9, 8, Central. Now you may be asking why add a field, an entirely new field that an editor is going to have to fill out every time they talk about a showtime, instead of just adding a little parser to the Alexa skill that says, when you see this letter C, say the word central. What you've done is offloaded the problem to the app. That means you're going to have to rewrite that code for Google Home, for Apple devices, for anything that reads it aloud, assistive devices. You're going to have to rewrite that parser for every single app. So why not just do the work once by making it usable data that then any read aloud device can interpret? So when the content is modular, it can be easily published to entirely different experiences as well, not just device specific context. By that I mean, let's say we have a text-based article. So here's an experience of content. It's text-based, it's text. 
That makes sense for some of these channels, but not all. So we're going to send it to a, a website, we're going to send it to the microsite that is uh, uh, built around that specific topic, and then we send it out to a feed. Now let's say we create a video. Well, that video is going to go to different contexts, different experiences. So the video will be sent to the website and the iPhone app and the Roku set-top box. But there also needs to be a text version for accessibility purposes, right? So this different experience can be sent to different devices. Maybe it's Alexa or a, um, an assistive device. It's the same story. It's the same message that you're trying to convey in your content, but it's told in different experiences and in different contexts. And centralized content allows you to do that intelligently by saying, I have a video, I have a transcript of the video, and I'm going to let the apps decide which of those things it wants and can use. And as the abilities of these devices uh, extend, like perhaps someday there's going to be a version of Roku that has a screen on it that can show you captions for a video. Uh, well, you've already got your transcript written, but also maybe it's intelligently translating that speech to text on the fly. So it's already built into the system that you've created. Now here's a, an interesting use case that a lot of people don't consider. This API that you've created can also be made public. So let's say you are a government institution or you're working on a grant funded project and part of that grant or, or part of the mission of your institution is to make your findings and your data freely and publicly accessible in some way. Most government institutions have to do this. The same API that you built to Decoupled can be used to make that content publicly available. You get it for free. All you need to do is document it so that people know how to access it. So now you are in compliance with regulations. So decoupling also enhances your compliance. The fan sites example is really interesting. So here's Twit. Several years ago, and this is one of the, the very first um, decoupled uh, Drupal sites out there, we worked with This Week in Tech. They're a podcast and video cast network. Uh, their content uh, is very technical. Their audience uh, tends to generally be developers and people in the web and technology space. And they have a really active fan base. So they knew early on that they wanted to decouple for a lot of business reasons. But one of them was, you know, if we make our content accessible to our audience, they're going to build all of our apps for us. And they did. So they made a website, a headless website. They made a documented, publicly accessible API. And then their fan base created Apple TV apps, Roku apps, all kinds of stuff. And they made it in their own way. Like they, 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 got, they got to kind of compete with one another to see who could build the best Apple TV Twit app. Uh, saved them a lot of money because they didn't have to build all of that. And because their audience was hungry to experiment with stuff, they wanted real content to work with. You know, it's one thing to, to build a prototype of, well, here's an Apple TV app that I made. If there were any real content in it, it would look like this or look like that. They get real world content to work with, which is really cool. So they're also enabling their audiences to expand their own skill set, which is really the whole point of This Week in Tech to begin with. So that was a really neat way to uh, side benefit of, of decoupling that we didn't foresee early on. Now this can also be done in the content creation side, decoupling. So what, what does this look like uh, inside a content creator? Editors routinely work, when, when your content is structured in this way, will, will routinely work with blocks or components. Uh, and in Drupal, many of us use the paragraphs module because, as you know, the term blocks is already reserved in the Drupal world. Uh, this is what, this is the way the paragraphs describes what this looks like uh, on their project page on Drupal.org. So here on the left, you have the content as it's displayed, but on the right is the editorial experience. So you have chunks of text, and these could be you know, literal paragraphs. Then you have images or a video that has associated metadata. So the images have a title and maybe a photo credit and some metadata tagging, things like that. Video has similar things too. But it's only going to show what's important, what's relevant. And it allows people to uh, click and drag and move these things around in the order that they, they want to tell this story, where they want these things to, to appear. So no longer do we have the world of a blob of content in an editor. We have each idea or each uh, piece of media, text, video, image, whatever, as isolated pieces that can be mixed and matched and resorted. The new WordPress editor, Gutenberg, is built on this idea of modular content. Gutenberg is really neat. It's really worth checking out. Uh, WordPress.org slash Gutenberg. 
These are some of the content blocks that they work with. Uh, so you can add a block in between any of these. Uh, you can reorder them. You can edit this text on the fly. It's really, really neat. And Drupal itself has also adopted Gutenberg. Uh, there is a Drupal port of Gutenberg. Version 1.0 was released uh, five weeks ago, and it's now production ready. So you can use this kind of block style editing, component style editing in Drupal as well. Prediction three, uh, content creators are finally going to get the tools that they deserve. So as we've seen with paragraphs in Gutenberg, there's this explosion of interest in creating better editorial experiences. And coupled with the need for modular content so that you can support multiple devices, this has led to new ways of thinking about and assembling content. So I suspect that we're going to see similar um, standalone CMS agnostic editing interfaces. So in the same way that you might adopt Drupal or WordPress or, or something as your backend CMS, there are likely going to be editorial tools that you can attach to it. You know, I prefer as an editor to work with XYZ editing interface uh, rather than um, being forced to use the, the tool that, that uh, your technology team is wedded to. For those of you who build websites frequently, and that's probably most of you in this room, how many of you have worked with or, or had to adopt something like WordPress because the editorial team said, I don't want to work in anything other than WordPress because it has the best experience for me, or it's the thing I'm used to, right? Who, how many people have heard, I want this CMS because that's what I know, right? And they're editors. They're not technology people. They're not thinking about modular content. They're not thinking about developing for multiple devices. They care about the editorial experience. Well, that editorial experience can be portable in the future. A new editor can show up and say, I really prefer this kind of editing experience, and the technology team can say, great, we're just gonna attach it to our existing content management system, and now you get to use that kind of interface. I believe that that's going to be happening very soon. And in some areas, it already is. So there are lots of hosted services, like Gather Content and Contentful, that have these very standard interfaces. So Gather Content, shown here, is really focused on content management at all levels. It focuses on content workflows, content governance, and campaign management. And they are marketing themselves as a, quote, content operations hub. That's gather content. Here we have Contentful, which is taking a slightly different path. It's positioning itself as a API first CMS focused on editorial experience and content modeling. One of the common complaints that uh, a lot of editors and site maintainers have is the inability to preview content before publishing. So that's where you get these tools like Gatsby Preview. Uh, and here's a, a fun example from one of our coworkers, Luke. Um, here he is working on a, a contentful site on the left, and he's just mashing the keyboard to, to uh, edit the uh, title there. And there's a Gatsby preview window that is automatically detecting that there is a change and reloading it. And this isn't live, but it's effect meaning this isn't the production site on the right, but it is a live site that he and other people can visit through a hashed URL. <clears throat> so all of this previewing stuff can be done really effectively now using things like Gatsby. We're also seeing some really uh, bold new ways to make traditional CMSs more editor-friendly in general without the need for a developer to make changes to, codes, uh, to code or templates. So here's an example. Uh, Cohesion built something called DX8. This is built on Drupal 8. DX8's uh, aim is to reduce the amount of development needed to produce great content and user experiences. So trying to eliminate the need for developers and designers to get involved in the content process, focusing mainly on marketers, content creators. Emulsify, which uh, we built at Four Kitchens and the um, project lead Evan is here in the audience, enables component-driven development for Drupal theming and design. Uh, this, again, is to alleviate the need for developers and designers to get involved in, in a lot of the content and uh, maintenance of the site. Uh, after only two years, Emulsify has more than, uh, or almost, 65,000 installations, and that's just in Drupal. Evan's going to be talking more about Emulsify tomorrow, um, so if you're interested in things like Gatsby and Storybook and, and the direction that Emulsify is headed in, I would recommend you check that out tomorrow at uh, 145. So one of the other things we're also seeing, content creators and designers are also expecting a lot more from their tool sets, not just the ability to edit content. So as a further example, Emulsify includes a living style guide that serves as both a reference for the design patterns on your site and the actual code, the actual markup and CSS that powers the site. 
So this is an example of a tool that, that could be considered mostly about prototyping and, and working with layouts, but also serves a real business need, having something like a living style guide that the entire organization can refer to. Prediction four, CMSs are going to focus on specific verticals and use cases. So we're already seeing a lot of specialization. Uh, marketing automation platforms, newsletter and email management tools like Sailthrough are effectively standalone CMSs that run in parallel to your existing website. There are constituent and campaign management platforms like Personify, uh, but what's really interesting though is the rise of CMSs, just the content that are specifically targeted to media, entertainment, and publishing. So here we have Thunder. Thunder is a uh, distribution of Drupal 8 focused on the media industry. It's sponsored, maintained, and used by Hubert Berta Media, which is one of Germany's largest publishers. Here we have the Washington Post's ARC, ARC publishing tool. Uh, WAPO, when it was uh, acquired by Jeff Bezos, Jeff Bezos did a very Amazon type thing and looked under the hood of Washington Post. And while on the surface, the Washington Post appears to be a leading newspaper that focuses particularly on the politics of DC and, and national politics in the United States, Jeff Bezos saw a technology company. He didn't see a, a newspaper. He didn't see journalists. He saw technology. And he saw this underlying CMS that they had been working on called ARC. So they decided to monetize it. So you can hire Washington Post, ARC Publishing, to overhaul your content management system and to reorganize your newsroom. So the angle that ARC Publishing is taking is they want to be a newsroom management system, not just content. So it's all of the workflows typically associated with uh, publishing magazines, newspapers, digital media, uh, moving content, for example, from desk to desk, the concept of desks. So you have a local desk and then that goes to to press and there are editors in between and it has to pass through different layers of approval and fact checking and all of that. ARC handles these things. Additionally, one of the, the really interesting things that I believe ARC does or will do soon, ARC is also leaning into content monetization as a core part of its offering. So what ARC can do is using a little bit of machine learning and some other rules you can put in place, it can start throttling the reg walls and paywalls on the site that it's powering. So a reg wall is you see a certain amount of content and you're prompted to create an account, usually for free. A paywall is you gotta pay for it, right? So if there's a really popular piece of content or breaking news, the ARC publishing system could potentially be intelligent enough to realize, oh, we're getting a big influx of traffic related to this topic. We're gonna let those people go down a further rabbit hole than usual because we really wanna hook them so rather than there being three articles you get for free, for this limited time, we're gonna make that five. And then when they hit five, they have to register or pay because then you're so invested in the topic, you wanna to keep going, right? That's the theory at least. And they're also testing this stuff on the fly. They're using machine learning to figure out what's the optimum amount of free content that we can give people before they actually do register or they actually do pay. ARC is really about monetization in that way. The way I've, I've described it, um, we've actually recommended ARC to, to one of our clients um, because they were so focused on the newsroom management. Uh, and one of the interesting ways that, that we've conceptualized ARC internally is most uh, companies, most organizations, when they build wireframes for a website, they have you know, the title and they have the text and they have the images and, and the header and the footer and then there's this like gray box that just says add, right? And it's like the ads will go there, I guess, and ad ops, they're responsible for that. We don't know, you know, we're designing the rest of the site. Just stick an ad in there. ARC flips that model completely and they say, here is the ad and everything else is a big gray box. That's your content, we don't care. We don't care what the content is. It's about the ad, right? So they're flipping that whole concept, which is really interesting. Vox, not to be outdone, has done the same thing. They've released their underlying CMS called Chorus. Uh, here's their, their one sentence pitch. Chorus is the only all-in-one publishing audience and revenue platform built for modern media companies operating at scale. It's not the only, but uh, notice revenue. Publishing audience and revenue platform. That's how Vox has decided to market its CMS. Doesn't really say a lot about content in there. It talks about distribution, people, making money. Makes sense. 
So there's a subtrend. Uh, all of these three CMSs were created by large media companies and they're making it available to the public through either open source, in the case of Thunder, or proprietary means, in the case of uh, Arc and Chorus. So publishing companies are becoming software companies, and they're trying to reduce or recoup their costs by releasing their internal uh, products and monetizing them. Prediction five, machine learning will help us manage and create content. CMSs can now read, see, and hear your content. It's reading and listening and watching what you are putting into your own sites. This is a huge paradigm shift, but it's gonna happen in the background, it's gonna happen subtly, and you're not even really gonna be aware of it, but it's already happening. So for example, Google is already introducing machine learning into many of its tools to improve search results, suggest responses, and automate tasks. How many of you have seen in Gmail some oddly accurate, you know, I want to finish that sentence for you kind of suggestion. And boy, it knows exactly how you talk. Guess why? It's been learning from you for years and years, and it has all of your email history to look back on. So it knows your turns of phrase. It knows how you like to punctuate. This is now going to become a standard uh, piece of functionality in, in the CMS in the next couple of years. So your CMS is going to feel out of touch if it doesn't have a deep understanding of your context of your voice, of your style, of your tone. Uh, but luckily, as machine learning grows in popularity, it'll become a lot less expensive and much easier to install and set up, and it's mostly just gonna be an out-of-the-box feature that you turn on. So machine learning is going to drastically simplify media management. Once upon a time, um, not too long ago, you had to tell your CMS where all of the content belonged. You'd have to file it away into some kind of primary category or tag it yourself or whatever. But with the help of machine learning, your CMS is going to add all of those metadata to your content, probably do it better than you could. It's gonna do it more intelligently than you probably will uh, because it's gonna know how your audience actually thinks because it's been paying attention and watching, whereas you are too busy making the content, right? So this is especially true of media management with images, video, sound files. Machine learning uh, can detect through image detection uh, uh, tools can auto-tag images. It knows what's in an image. It helps editors search image libraries within your CMS. It provides accessibility metadata uh, automatically. So you are now complying with accessibility rules um, out of the box. Natural language processing can create transcripts of video and audio files that then improve search results. But this isn't all good news. Uh, machine learning is, of course, a product of its training. It is, by definition, biased in everything that it has been shown and been trained. So unless you are uh, constantly using, unless you have a really broad data set and you are constantly teaching it and adjusting it and, and course correcting it, it will, by definition, reinforce biases. And all you have to do is Google artificial intelligence you know, bias or image recognition mistake and you will see some like truly horrific and offensive examples of uh, artificial intelligence getting it very, very wrong. In the future, in the very near future, in fact right now, CMSs will create content from scratch using artificial intelligence. In September 2017, Digiday reported that the Washington Post had published 850 AI-generated articles in its first year of operation. 850 articles in the Washington Post in one year. This included 500 articles about the 2016 U.S. election, and these articles generated more than half a million clicks, which, in their words, not a ton in the scheme of things, but most of these were stories that the Post wasn't going to dedicate staff to anyway. So these are articles that never would have been written that still generated half a million clicks because a computer wrote the articles for them. Here's what it looks like. So uh, they used uh, AI, as I mentioned, to follow a lot of the uh, 2016 election cycle, but they also deployed it to write stories about local high school football games. So here is what a computer wrote. The Landon Bears shut out the visiting Whitman Vikings 34 to zero on Friday Landon opened the game with a 90-yard kickoff, returned for a score by Jelani Makin. Landon added to their lead on, on John Gepper's five-yard touchdown run. The first quarter came to a close with Landon leading 14-0, and it goes on from there. A computer wrote this. Pretty amazing. It's using raw data from, uh, I don't know where, maybe a video, maybe a, a sports announcer, something, 
and it wrote this article about a high school football game. The New York Times Associate Press writers and Yahoo Sports all use AI to write stories today. And in March, the Press Association, which is a leading UK news agency, announced that they can publish 30,000 local news stories per month using artificial intelligence. 30,000 local news stories in one wire service per month today. So some of these publishers are already uh, employing sentiment analysis on ad delivery systems to avoid embarrassing ad placements. So for example, if an algorithm detects that an article is critical of Dow Chemical, then it knows not to advertise a Dow Chemical product in that article. That's happening today, and that makes sense, right? Uh, but there are some uh, more interesting things that you can do with machine learning. So let's talk about emotional tone. Uh, we at Four Kitchens wanted to see how easy it would be to use machine learning to generate content ourselves. So for an event uh, last April, we built something called Happy Gram, which is a Drupal-powered website that turns happy memories into shareable postcards that look like this. So what we received from the person who walked up to the booth was this statement, this memory. I ran into an old friend. I'm about to go visit him in Costa Rica in June, and I'm really excited about that. That's, that's what the person said to us. We then ran that through uh, Google's natural language processing engine. So here's the original text at the top. Then it, did, uh, it identified the entities in the syntax. So it found that the two most important entities in this statement were friend and Costa Rica. Friend is an entity type person. Costa Rica is a location. So from there, it tried to piece together some statements to look up images that might be relevant to this memory. So rather than just picking single words like friend, old, you know, Costa Rica, it tried to be a little more descriptive. So it would glue together some things like old friend, uh, be about, which is kind of an interesting, you know, you have to train these things and it's funny what it picks up on sometimes, but like be about isn't really all that helpful. But old friend Costa Rica run. Now, of course, in this case, it doesn't understand that um, run into is just a colloquial idiomatic way of saying met, saw, became reacquainted with. So it literally picked up on run. So there's some running imagery that it tried to suggest. But this is where human inter interaction intervention comes into play yet again. The editor, the person providing this story, has an opportunity to pick the four images that they like, right? The, the computer doesn't have to automatically choose those four. There's some human interaction there. So the, the person picked the four images that they felt were, were um, meaningful, and these were all pulled from a uh, Creative Commons licensed uh, service called Unsplash. Then it determined sentiment. It wanted to know if this was a negative memory or a positive memory, and it ranked it a 0.4, which is in the positive spectrum. And so what that then, uh, what that, what happened then was the images had their uh, um, uh, saturation turned up, so the colors became brighter, the images became lighter because it's a happier memory. If it were a sad memory, you would mute the colors down to match the emotional tone. So that's the first bit of post processing we did. Then we categorized it in two different kinds of memories. Was it bonding, affection, enjoy the moment, achievement, exercise, back to nature? It found that this was about bonding. It was about two people bonding. So then there was an image filter that we applied to bonding. Uh, you, it's kind of washed out on this display here, but it, it gave it kind of like a, 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 a deeper, richer color. And in the end, we wound up with that image that you saw that had kind of brightened imagery. Uh, it had a filter applied based on the, the kind of memory. Here's another example. I had oysters yesterday. They were different from regions. They were from different regions, and I had a glass of white wine. Uh, they were different sizes, and each was different. This is a human came up, told us this, saw some image, images, picked the four that they felt best represented the memory. A computer did post processing on it. Uh, here's a great example snuggling with dogs in my bed, it gave it this rosy hue, right? These images didn't come in this color. This was all done by a, uh, a computer. So the computer is measuring the emotional tone and quality of the memory and manipulating images to match the mood. You can do that right now for free. Prediction six, reality will be augmented. So if you've seen me speak in the last couple of years, you've probably heard me talk about how like VR is gonna be really big. I was wrong about that. Uh, I got really excited, um, but AR is quietly infiltrating our everyday lives in ways that you're probably not even aware of right now. The potential is huge and it's really useful. This is Google Lens. This was announced just a few weeks ago. So CNET reported, it feels like a pair of smart glasses without the glasses. 
The camera-enabled app can already be used for object recognition, translation, shopping, and recognizing the world. In this example, Google Lens is highlighting a menu's most popular choices, cross-reference with its data of reviews, and then each of these uh, menu items that are like the most popular things in the menu link to images that people have taken of those menu items as found on Google Places. You can do this right now. Uh, Google for a while has been touting this example of like, man, wouldn't it be cool to like have 3D models that show up in real life and you can kind of see the scale of things and for some reason you want to see a spacesuit by the Bay Bridge? I don't know. Uh, but here's, here's the demo that they've been showing for a while. Uh, here's this thing that looks oddly like Wikipedia, right? So you want to look up something about the spacesuit. Like, oh, I want to see the spacesuit. Well, here's this 3D model that on a desktop you can use your mouse and kind of click around on it. Oh, that, that's neat. You know, okay, spacesuit. Well, in the mobile version, in an AR-enabled experience, you click on this little AR icon in the bottom right, and then you get this. This interface for placing it on a surface, you can move it around, and now you see it to scale. What? <coughs> Well, they had been shopping around this demo for a while, and then they just went ahead and did it. So here is uh, the NASA Curiosity Mars rover in Google search results today that you can just drop and place, but I will get to that in a moment. So these AR and VR experiences are often three-dimensional, so it's no surprise that we're seeing an explosion of 3D assets on the web. So this is a new kind of content that's being born on the web. This is a website called Sketchfab. Sketchfab is a, uh, a marketplace for sharing and selling 3D models, 3D animations. It's like a, a, a shutterstock, but for 3D models. This extends to 3D printing and fabrication. Same thing, but now we're talking about actually printing those 3D objects using printers. So pin shape here is like Sketchfab or shutterstock, but for printable objects that you can then download and make on your own. When I was polling our team, like, what do you think the future of content's gonna be? The, one of the most interesting uh, ideas I got was from a, one of our developers, Chris Martin, who said that he believes that the new space race is going to result in an explosion of 3D printing technology. Because in order to cost effectively make it to uh, a moon base or to make it to Mars, you can't bring every tool you're ever going to need with you. But you can bring the raw materials to make the tools that you need on demand and then recycle them back into the system. So when you need a wrench, you go print yourself a wrench and you use it till it breaks, you throw it back in the recycler, you make another wrench. This is possible today. And this content has to be managed on a website. Prediction seven, uh, content delivery is going to be context specific. By that I mean content is going to be delivered to you based on uh, where you are, what you're doing, and what you're trying to achieve. A great example of this is iTunes. So iTunes launched in 2001, it was a game changer, right? Like great media uh, management, you got this cool device called an iPod, like this is amazing, you can buy stuff, buy music. Uh, then they started adding other media. You could buy TV shows, you could buy movies, yet you're all doing it in this thing called iTunes. Well, just a couple weeks ago, they said, uh, we're now splitting iTunes into multiple apps and iTunes is going away. So iTunes is now gonna have a separate podcast app, TV app, movies app. For iPhone users, you've seen this for a while, but this is now happening in Mac OS. So they are now creating context-specific applications for content. Apple's announcement uh, quickly followed on the heels of Google adding playable podcast episodes to search results. So if you search for popular podcasts, like here's uh, Gimlet's Reply All, it will show you the most recent or most popular episodes that are playable instantly in search results. Now, of course, it's taking you to Google's podcasting platform because they want to hook you there. But now podcasts have been elevated to a native playable piece of content directly in search results. You don't have to go get a podcast app and subscribe to an RSS feed to listen to podcasts. Okay, here's the really cool example. Please don't take out your phone just yet. Please wait until the very end. Uh, Google has also added AR uh, 3D objects to their search results. So you can search for a number of types of animals and you will be able to see that animal at scale, on the floor, on your desk, whatever. Here's what happens when you Google dog on a desktop. It's a pretty standard search result, right? Here's some images, here's a Wikipedia article about dogs. Well, if you do it on a mobile device, Oh, there's a view in 3D button. What does that do? So you tap on that, 
Now you get the object, you can manipulate the object in 3D, and then there's that AR button at the top. So now you can drop the dog. This is all in Google search results. You can do this right now. Don't do it right now. <laughs> but you can, you can search for like dragon, cat, zebra, horse, all kinds of different animals. Mars Curiosity Rover. All of this you can do right now in Google search results. Kids would have fun. Yeah, exactly. This is content that has to be managed. It has to be searchable. It has to have metadata associated with it. It has to work on multiple devices, right? Future of content. All right, last prediction. Uh, distribution channels will be restricted and monetized. Streaming services are being built around exclusive content. Uh, so many producers are launching their own streaming services rather than partnering with existing channels like Netflix and Hulu. Uh, CBS, for example, launched All Access in 2016, which provided streaming only content like The Twilight Zone and Star Trek Discovery. So they're creating content, very popular content, that is only accessible through their own streaming service that you have to pay for. They don't broadcast it. Uh, and uh, you can't get it through something like Netflix, Hulu, whatever. You have to get their app, their service. In 2018, by August 2018, it had 2.5 million paying subscribers for just CBS content alone. In January this year, NBC announced that they intend to enter the streaming wars as well, which means they are ending their deal with Netflix to syndicate The Office and Friends, the two most popular shows on Netflix. So now NBC is going to get Netflix's audience on their own app. This is happening right now. Uh, there's a lot of money in podcasts. So don't let the DIY roots of podcasts fool you. Podcasts are serious business. This month, the Interactive Advertising Bureau reported podcast ad revenue in the United States increased 53% in 2018, totaling almost $500 million. The IAB expects ad revenue to grow another 42% in 2019 to $680 million. That's ad revenue for podcasts. So podcasts used to be platform agnostic, but they're now consolidating onto paid platforms with exclusive content deals. So uh, September 2018, media giant iHeartMedia acquired podcast company Stuff Media in a deal thought to be worth $55 million. In February of this year, Spotify acquired Gimlet Media, producers of Reply All and a bunch of others, and Anchor, a podcast creation, distribution, and monetization platform, in a deal thought to be worth about $250 million. Spotify wants to continue investing up to another $500 million in acquisitions just around podcasts. So podcasts are major, major business, are very, very popular, and are content that have to be managed. Okay, last word on advertising. Uh, when you download podcasts, speaking of podcasts, ads are dynamically in injected into that MP3 file based on all of the information they have about you. Your location, what you just listened to, other things that you're subscribed to, whatever. There's a reason why people are buying up podcasting apps and why people are creating their own podcasting apps. PRX, PRI, for example, uh, they have their own app called Pocket Casts. Well, they're using that to figure out what you like. So when you download an episode of whatever, Criminal, you get an ad injected in there that is targeted to everything that they know about you. This isn't like when somebody buys an ad for a podcast, it's not, I'm going to buy an ad for this one episode and it's going to stay in that episode forever. That stuff gets injected just like any other ad on any other website. Second thing, when you visit a site, the ad space on that site, that gray box that I talked about earlier, is auctioned off live based on everything that that site knows about you and the highest bidder gets the ad shown. All of this happens in milliseconds. So every time you load a page and you see an ad, chances are you were just bid on. So did they pay a dollar for your attention? Did they pay $10 for your attention? 10 cents? You don't know. But all of that is happening live in the background and that's how uh, intense this industry is becoming. And again, this is all content, it's all data that they know about you and has to be managed. Okay, so let's summarize very quickly future of the CMS, or future, future of content. CMSs will be content repositories, not website managers. Content will be extensible and modular. Content creators will finally get the tools that they deserve. CMSs will focus on specific verticals and use cases, like newsrooms. Machine learning will help us manage and create content, understanding emotional tone, reacting accordingly. 
reality will be augmented, finding a 3D dog in your search results, content delivery will be context specific, and distribution channels will be restricted and monetized. I'm a little over time, so I can talk with you out in the hall if you'd like to. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you.